So as you know, if you've been with us, we have been putting everything we've got into focusing on our one thing, right? Jesus Christ. And we're using this Advent wreath to do that. So we got the four black candles, um, and they're surrounding that white Christ candle in the middle. And those four black candles represent kind of the consequences that we experience when our hearts and minds totally lose focus off of what matters most. And so instead of continuing to just do what we do every single year, we're thinking long and hard about why we do what we do at Christmas. And so the question that we've been asking is, when Christmas is over, do we want to feel dead, weighed down by debt, exhausted, feeling alone and depressed? Do we want to feel dead inside because we've allowed the holiday expectations and traditions to just run us into the ground? Or... Do we want to be alive in Christ? Because we spent the entire Advent season focusing on what matters most, and that's our relationship with Jesus Christ. So two weeks ago, we snuffed out um, this, this candle. It represents debt, right? I can't do that and, and focus on this at the same time. Um, you know, we don't want to be um, spending money on things we don't need with money that we don't have, right? Instead, we want to be rich in love um, and in meaningful fellowship so that we can build one another up in Christ rather than rack up suffocating credit card bills, right? Last week, we gladly snuffed out the exhaustion candle. Um, Because, you know, we don't want to get sucked into those merciless schedules and commitments, right, that just exhaust us. Instead, we want to enjoy the peace and the rest that Christ came to give us. And so let's watch this video to see what we're um, considering this week. ironic that at Christmas we celebrate Emmanuel, God with us, and yet we can feel so alone. We go from place to place and party to party, surrounded by people, but we never quite quench that loneliness inside. Scripture tells us that at the, from the very beginning, we were designed to be in community with one another, but that community is ultimately empty if it's not grounded in and centered all around Christ. These horizontal human relationships that we all have, they're broken to one degree or another by sin. And the only way that we can ever have meaningful and and life-giving relationships is when our souls first find healing and genuine life-giving fellowship and joy through Christ. He is the only one that satisfies what our souls most long for. God became a man. He literally put on flesh so that we might know and be known by him. More than that, that we might personally love and be loved by him. He is a God who longs for relationship with us, that we might never, ever feel alone 
again. So church, let's remember that this Christmas. Let's lean into and pursue the greatest treasure of all, which is intimacy with Jesus Christ in all of our gatherings. May he be the one that we celebrate most and may our hearts overflow with gratitude for all the people that we get to share him with. We're 14 days and one sleep away from Christmas. So what can you and your family do this year to strip away all those things that rob you of the life and the joy and the hope that Jesus came to bring us so that you can focus on him alone? And all of our holiday happenings, may each and every one of us seek God's glory alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that in Christ... You are Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you that you came. You pursued us, you rescued us, and you want to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us so that we never have to feel alone again. Now as we turn our attention to the message that you have given David, we ask that you would give us understanding and help us respond with humble, joyful obedience in whatever way your spirit leads us. It's in Jesus' name and for his glory we pray. Amen. So the scripture that David's going to be preaching through this morning is John chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, but I'm going to start reading in verse 1 of that chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. All right, good to see everybody again. Here we are, this third week in Advent, 14, and a wake up until that big day. So hopefully I trust that we're all standing firm against those waves and waves of anxiety that tend to roll over us this time of year, truly. It's important that we just keep checking our pulse, making sure it stays low, and that we keep our eyes fixed on the Christmas that we find in Scripture, not the chaotic Christmas that the world wants us to celebrate. Truly, with the Lord's help for a while, we got this. So stand firm over these next couple of weeks. And to be clear, we're not saying that we have to cut out all the gift giving and all the card writing and all the cookie making and decorating and all that stuff that tends to wear us out. We don't need to cut that out altogether. We're just saying that we shouldn't let them distract us from the single greatest event in all of human history, God sending his own son to become a man so that we might be in a relationship with him and spend all of eternity with him. And that's exactly why we're focused on this critically important question this year. When Christmas is over, Will we be dead, in debt, exhausted, alone, and depressed because we gave into all the things that the world told us that we had to do in order to have a Merry Christmas? Or when we start 2024, will we be alive in Christ because we kept our eyes fixed on the one thing, on our relationship with Jesus, which is exactly why we're studying the Gospel of John this year. Because John, he just suits about as straight as any of the gospel writers. In fact, as we've noted, he doesn't talk about mangers or shepherds or wise men or any of that stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. But he just is focused on that one thing. He is focused on Jesus and making sure we're really clear about all that it means that we celebrate at Christmas. And we see this very specifically in our text for today, where John writes very clearly, concisely, and directly that the true light which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Now, before we dive into this, I want for us to pause for just a moment to consider how amazing this statement really is. I mean, if you knew nothing about Jesus, you knew nothing about 
the Bible, religion, anything like that, if you heard this very statement you see up there, it would cause you to pause, wouldn't it? The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. That would have to get your attention because something pretty important is clearly about to go down and you want to sit up and take notice so you don't miss out. And of course, we already learned a little bit about what this coming light that John refers to is all about. In the original language, it means reason, understanding, especially with regard to moral and spiritual truth. Now remember, God made man in his image. It's what makes mankind completely different from all other species out there. Humans have this inner being that can reason. They have the capacity to understand, especially moral and spiritual truth. That's what this light actually refers to. And notice how John also qualifies the light as the true light, meaning this is not just an appearance of reason. It's not some reflection of it. Rather, it's real. It's genuine. It's the original source of all reason, all understanding, and all truth. So this is actually a really big deal. We all need to most certainly sit up and take notice because we don't often get to experience the authentic original of anything, let alone true light. So to fully grasp what John is saying here, I want to push a little bit more on his use of this word light. Every object that emits some form of life borrows the elements of it from some other source. Now to see what I mean, just think about the moon for a moment. The moon does not produce light, it reflects light that emanates from the sun. So then you're probably thinking to yourself, well then the sun clearly creates some form of light. But that's actually not quite right, because although the light rays come from the sun, they aren't the original source of sunlight, because sunlight is actually the result of nuclear fusion whenever elements of hydrogen are transformed into helium. And of course, those elements of hydrogen didn't just appear out there on their own. They came from somewhere, some genuine source, and that's what this word true is getting after. And we know from the past two weeks that the true light refers to Jesus, the very Son of God. He's all part of creation. So as John goes on to teach us here, Jesus is the one who gives light to everyone. Now John's use of this word, everyone, focuses us in on the genuine source of light for all mankind. And that harkens back to the creation account. Because the very first thing God did on the very first day was to create light. And that's because light is the foundation, it is the necessary condition for all physical life out there. So in order for the very first man, Adam, to physically exist along with the rest of creation, there had to be light. But in addition to this light being the source of all physical life, it's also the source of all spiritual life. Because physical life is really just the metaphor for the spiritual light. Reason understanding, especially moral and spiritual truth. So John is referring specifically to mankind because man is the only species with reason, understanding, the ability to know right from wrong and to grasp truth. And so that then begs the next question. Is this light for all men or is this light for just some men? Well, John makes it pretty clear. He says, everyone. So it's reason and understanding about moral and spiritual truth for all mankind. You see, all humans have the ability to reason, to understand, to know right from wrong. It's what separates us from the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. And this capacity that sets us apart, well, it came from the true light, the very source of all truth. And this true light which gives light to everyone, was now coming into the world. Again, this is why it's so important that we consider this statement. We don't want it to ever become too familiar to us. We should pause and reflect on it quite a bit throughout this season 
Because just think about how astounding, how remarkable it really is that God would do this, that he would send his own son, the real, the genuine, the original source through whom all things were created to actually then enter into the very world that he created in human form as a baby. It's truly remarkable when you think of it in that light. It's something actually that you could never make up, which is the very definition of truth, the real, the genuine, the original. It's not some vague appearance. It's what actually happened. And why would God do this? Why would he send his son to come down from heaven to earth? Well, to bring spiritual light into a world that had been darkened by sin. So that all of mankind, everyone, might have a personal view of this light. One that was a bit more relatable than in the past. Meaning a human-to-human connection. A relationship. You see, Jesus became a man so that he could better relate all of us to God. Meaning he could now relate to him on a more human level, right? Because now we see God as a human not as a pillar of cloud or a pillar of smoke, where we can engage with him now in reason so that we better understand God, but especially with regard to moral and spiritual truth. So you see, the Messiah that Israel had been waiting for to free them from all of their worldly oppressors, going back to the Assyrians and then the Babylonians and the Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans, was actually the Son of God who would come instead to free them from their spiritual oppression. He would come to bring the spiritual light that would overcome the darkness of our sin. You see, they didn't need a physical king. They needed a spiritual king, and so do we. And that's why the king of heaven came down to earth in the form of a human, so that we could all be in a relationship with him, and so that he could stand in our place to bear the punishment for all of our sin. That's what John the Baptist was on about last week. John was sent to show us that the Son of God, the true light, was actually in the world now. The world that was made through him, yet the world didn't know him. Now the word used here for world is cosmos, and in the original language it means those alienated from God. So why were they alienated from God? Well, because of the darkness of their sin. You see, God is perfectly holy, white, hot, holy, and he simply cannot be in the presence of sin. And that's why the world is alienated from him, because the world is spiritually dark, and he is spiritual light. And notice how this word world refers to those who are alienated from God, meaning people who are alienated from God, mankind, those who were made in God's image, those who have reason, understanding, and inner being that knows right from wrong. But because they choose wrong, because they give in to temptation, because they choose self over God, sin has made them dark, and they are therefore alienated from the light of Christ. That's why the world doesn't know God. They, by their very nature, are children of wrath, as Paul has taught us. Or as he writes in his letter to Rome, referencing the psalmist, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And that's why the world doesn't know God. It's why they're alienated from him. They don't seek him. They're focused on themselves instead. It's why Paul says that they're of no worth on their own. It's why they don't do good. Well, they have the capacity to do good, but they don't choose it. All have fallen short. There is no one without sin. So the world is darkness. It does not know the light of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. It's bad enough that the world he created didn't know him. But the Apostle John goes on to write here that he even came to his own and his own people 
did not receive him. So who are his own people? Well, think about how John is writing this his, from his perspective. Well, he's referring clearly to Israel, God's chosen nature, those God made his covenants with, the likes of Abraham, Moses, and David, where God promised to be their God, and they would be his people, leading them out of captivity, making them victorious on the battlefield, caring for them in the desert as he guided them to this promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey that God set apart for his beloved children. And all the while, his own people, they continued to rebel, continuing to grumble, bowing down to idols of the world, living in darkness, rejecting his word, rejecting his messengers, prophet after prophet, century by century, more than 300 prophecies of a coming Messiah. Very specific details, down to the very place of his birth, Bethlehem. And Jesus, the true light, fulfilling every single one of these hundreds of prophecies, and yet his own people didn't receive him. They knew all about this coming Messiah. They had been waiting for him for centuries, and here he was now, but they didn't receive him. Why is that? Because they're every bit as darkened by their sin as the rest of the world. None is righteous. No, not one. Now, to truly grasp just how remarkable this all really is, I want for us to close today by reading just one of the, these many prophecies about Jesus. In the year around 600 BC or so, the prophet Jeremiah foretold some details about the coming Messiah as part of the new covenant that God would make with his people. Jeremiah wrote, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. And pay particularly close attention to this part. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. These words contain many of the conditions of the promise that God made under the new covenant, the covenant that we all live under. And as we know, God always lives up to his promise. It's what actually forms the basis for our faith. Our faith is in the fact that God cannot break his promise. He has to live up to it. So it's astounding that the nation of Israel, they had these very words too, and yet they would not receive him. And so as I reflected on this, I wonder, is that us too, still today? In 2023, are we just like the nation Israel, so darkened by our sins, so caught up in the things of this world that we actually don't receive him either? It's why this question we're studying throughout this Advent season is so vitally important to every single one of us, because it actually helps us confront this question in a very personal and very tangible way. Will we allow our focus on all the worldly holiday traditions, the gifts, the cards, the gingerbread, the gathering, the trees, all that stuff to make us dead, in debt, exhausted, alone, and depressed, such that we don't receive him either? Or will we fix our eyes on Jesus, focusing on our relationship with him instead, so that when Christmas is over, we actually find ourselves alive in Christ. Do you see how this question helps reveal whether we're just like the nation Israel or not, who knew all about him, but failed to actually receive him? 